can't do it anymore. I have nothing left. Between the divorce, the cancer, your mom dying and being laid off, I know it feels like you're going through a lot. <laughs> Believe me, I have been there. Just remember, when God closes a door, he opens a window. And never forget, God never gives you more than you can handle. Uh, uh, uh. God never said that. Oh, I've got another one if you want to take a shot. Yeah, they come as a pair. Bring it. All right. We're continuing our series. I got these great videos. I love it. It's called God Never Said That. And uh, have you ever been, uh, have you ever got great advice like that from people? Don't you just love when people come up to you and say, God got this. You know, God helps those who help themselves. It's okay. I know what you're going through. No, you don't. And, and, and I've learned sometimes the best thing to do when someone's going through something is to be quiet and just be there for somebody. But we hear these statements a lot. Like, for example, God just wants me happy. I mean, that was last week. I hear it so many times. And even I have fallen, even me, <laughs> have fallen into that, well, God just wants me happy. I'm not happy, so it must not be God's will. And a lot of people believe a lot of things about God as if it's Scripture, and it's not. For example, God helps those who help themselves. That's nowhere in the Scripture, by the way. I don't know if you realize that. Another one is, God will never give you more than you can handle. I got good news and bad news. The bad news is that's not true. God will give you more than you can handle. And some of you are like, oh, no, this is not very good. I just want to leave right now. I mean, that's, that's something I often quote and often say. Guys, it's the truth of the matter is God will give you more than you can handle. I don't know if you've ever been to a place where you feel like, I, I can't handle it anymore. I, there was a couple times in my life that I, I thought at that moment I was going through it. I, I just can't take it anymore. I, I'm, at, I'm at the threshold. I, I just, the dam's broken. That's it. I'm done. You know, and maybe some of you have been through those circumstances. You felt that way. You felt you were out of your wits. And sometimes what can happen, well, God say he won't give me more than I can handle. But man, this is more than I can handle. So we often hear, how about this one? When God closes a door, he opens a window. What happens if you're on the 12th floor? <laughs> so you hear, you hear these types of things all the time. And, you know, a lot of these misnomers. And next week, I'm excited about the week after, we'll be talking about this. It doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. Or it doesn't matter what you do as long as it doesn't hurt anybody. And we have these thinking that we think in our minds. And, you know, if we think the wrong things, we'll live the wrong way. So what does the Bible do say? What does the Bible say about God giving you more than you can handle. The truth is, God will give you more than you can handle. He'll give you children more than you can handle. He'll give you a spouse that's more than you can handle. He'll give you a job, all right? He'll give you a church that's more than you can handle. And he'll let you become overwhelmed. Make no mistake about it. And if you're shaking your belief today, I have good news. There's good news is coming, okay? This is not a bad news. But I think what can happen a lot of the times, if we think that, that God won't give me more than I can handle. What happens when you can't handle it? You get extremely discouraged. You feel God has abandoned you. But we're going to look at it today and, and, and see what it really means. The good news is we have better and greater news than that, an opportunity to respond and dwarf the sphere that you will have more than you can handle. So where does that come from? God won't give you more than I can handle. Give you more than you can handle. What well, comes from 1 Corinthians 10, 13, a very famous scripture verse, is dealing with, dealing with temptation. And that you would not be tempted more than... You put that screen, I'll have scripture up there, that'd be great. Uh, 10, 13 says this. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. He's talking about the context is temptation, not difficulties, not hardships in life. There are times where you will be overwhelmed. And I heard this growing up, all my life I heard this. You're either going into a storm, in the middle of a storm... Or coming out of a storm. Isn't that encouraging? I feel so encouraged. But the truth is, is it not the truth? That just like as you're getting out of something, something happens. Life is hard. Jesus says, in this world, you will have trouble. But rejoice, I've overcome the world. So we're going to have trouble in this world. And God will give us more than we're able to handle. 
Well, how are we supposed to handle that if we can't handle it? <laughs> well, that's the good news today. The first point today is simply this. God will give you more than you can handle. We can see Gideon, for example, in the book of Judges. He was overwhelmed at the wine press, hiding from his enemy. He said, I cannot do this. I'm the least of my family. I can't do this. We've seen other people, for example. We've also seen not only him, but we've seen Moses overwhelmed. Who am I? I I'm supposed to go to Pharaoh? I can't speak. <laughs> Okay, Moses had a hard time speaking, and yet he's supposed to be speaking. Who am I? I I'm, a, I'm a convict. I, I had to flee the country, and I've been here 40 years taking care of sheep. What do you mean I'm supposed to deliver the people from Israel, uh, from, from Egypt, excuse me? How am I supposed to do that, God? You ever felt that way where you're like, I just can't do this. I, the Lord, this, this person I married, I can't take anymore. I can't take my kids anymore. I can't take my parents anymore. I can't take this job. I cannot stop this addiction. I can't stop doing it. I can't stop smoking it or drinking it. I can't stop worrying. I can't stop lying. I can't stop lusting. Whatever it could be. And it just seems like you just can't overcome it. And you keep on hearing, well, God won't give you more than I can handle. Well, really? This is more than I can handle. And it doesn't do me a lot of good. So what's, what I find so encouraging is not only did these people not know how to handle it, but there were times Jesus even had more than he could handle. Do you realize that? Now, don't, I'm not being sacrilegious. That's the honest truth. Jesus was given more than he could handle. Do you remember the time when he was carrying his cross? It says in the scriptures, in Matthew 27 and 32, along the way there came a cross, a man named Simon, who was from Cyrene, and the soldiers forced him to carry Jesus' cross. Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. Well, Jesus couldn't even carry his cross. What makes you think you can carry it by yourself? I'm so glad that God shows us these things. Jesus, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, before he was put on the cross, he was crying out to God, Medical science tells us today that there's a condition where you're under such great anxiety, an anxiety attack supernova, where it, you are under such great anxiety, your heart pumps so hard because of anxiousness, your capillaries break, and it mixes with your sweat glands, and it seems like you're sweating blood. Well, that was a condition that Jesus went through. Now, if a well-meaning Christian was there, oh, Rejoice, lift your hands and say, our God reigns here, and you'll be fine. Go to pray, put a praise and worship CD on and put your hands up. Come on, worship God. Well, guess what? He was going through that. He was overwhelmed. Father, I cannot do this. This is too much for me. So even Jesus knows what it's like when it's too much to bear. You're not alone in this, folks. And so if you believe that God won't give you more than you can bear, you're in for a, a surprise because he will give you more than you can bear. But what I find so encouraging is this. Do you realize when Jesus was being, when he was going through all that, he took Peter, James, and John and says, here, guys, pray with me. He wanted people to be with them during that difficult time. And sometimes the best thing you can do when someone's going through a horrible death of a loved one or going through cancer or going through something terrible, a horrible divorce or a child that's rebellious or, or, or losing their job or whatever they're going through, sometimes the best thing you can do is just be with them. But the good thing is this. As Jesus cried out to God, cried out to the Father, the Bible says the angels comforted him. You see, you and I are designed to be in community. We're not called to live this thing all by ourselves. And that even Jesus had his body, his friends about and around him. You see, that's why it's important that we get connected to God, connected to his body. The Bible says in John 5, 19, so Jesus explained this. This was earlier in his ministry. He says, I tell you the truth. The son can do nothing by himself. Well, God won't give me more than I'm able to handle. Well, he just said something. The son cannot do it by himself. And this is the key you're going to see. He does only what he sees the father doing. Whatever the father does, the son does. Jesus also says in John 15, 4, remain in me and I will remain in you. 
For a branch cannot produce fruit if it's severed from the vine, and you cannot bear fruit unless you remain in me. You see, this is the truth of the matter is this. If you can handle it by yourself, you're not pleasing God. If you can handle your marriage by yourself, you're not pleasing God. If you can handle your children by itself, you're not pleasing God. If you can handle your work or whatever situation by yourself, you're not pleasing God. If you're trying to pastor a church or be a part of a church and you can do it by yourself, you're not pleasing God. Why is that? Well, Hebrews 11, 6 says the following. It says, without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. In other words, if you're doing things in your own strength, then you're doing it with your own power. You don't need God. And what's the difference? Well, this is the difference. I think a lot of times you and I, we have these batteries that we've installed in our lives. Imagine this. Imagine just, uh, if you could, uh, with me, that at one time we were just plugged into God and that's how we functioned. But now we've gone to a place where we have battery packs. And what we do is we charge ourselves up when we go to church. We charge ourselves reading the Bible. We charge ourselves up encouraging ourselves. But our battery runs dry. But God has never asked us to collect him. He's asked us to live in him. Jesus told his disciples, out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. He does not say, out of your innermost being will be a cistern or it will be a tank that you'll draw from. He doesn't say that. He says, out of your innermost being will be rivers, which is active, which is living, and that Christ has made us to be in real time with him, not reading back from the past, but being in real time with him. You see, that's how we're designed. Jesus said, I do nothing unless I see the Father doing it. The Greek tense in there is present continuous action. In other words, it's happening real time, all the time. That's why it says in Thessalonians 5, I think it's 7, 16 through 17, it says, do pray without ceasing. So without faith, it's impossible to please him. So the question is, what am I doing? What are you doing in your marriage that you can't do by yourself? What are you doing in your business you can't do without God? I remember a couple, three, four years ago when I felt the Lord was saying, it's time to build a church. And, and I was thinking, I really don't want to do that. I've seen what has happened to other people that have gone through that. So I wasn't quite sure it's the right thing to do. But as I prayed about it, I felt confirmed by it. And I believe the Lord, I said, Lord, I can't do this. This is good. You're in a good place. It reminds me of my father uh, David, he was here uh, about three weeks ago preaching, and he had a situation where he was an orphan child who bounced from place to place to place, and never, no one ever told him that, that he was loved. He felt called to go in the ministry. And this is what he said, God, I have nothing to give. He says, as, and this is what he heard the Lord say in his heart, as long as you're empty, I can fill you. See, if you're full of yourself, you can't be full of God. I think a lot of us are full of ourselves. Religious selves. And we, we kind of draw from this battery and we try to do that. You know, what happens if you have stagnant water and you put it without chlorination? What happens? You have paramecium start growing. Remember that in fourth grade science? Remember what, ha what happens? The water gets bad. But out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. He was talking about the spirit that was not yet given. You see, God is in a real-time relationship drawing strength. And a lot of us, the problem with us is we have battery packs and we're plugged into ourselves. We look within ourselves. We rely on our past knowledge and our past experience. There's nothing wrong, like in a car, for example. It's all right to have a battery, but you need an alternator. You need the engine running or your car will drop and in many ways we do the same thing with God I'll plug in Sunday I'll charge up and I'll unplug God has never called us to unplug we're made to be in constant communication with him this is our design I don't know if you realize this there's something is fundamentally wrong with mankind when he's disconnected with God and even if you're a believer in Christ you're limiting the scope of what God can do within you if you unplug and plug into yourself well, I think that self-reliance is important. Relying on God. You see, when I got called to, to build this building, it was, it was difficult. It's like, how am I supposed to do that? I, one of my officials that was over me, it, it's one of my overseers, and said, you know, I wouldn't do what you're doing, man. That's going to be tough. I'm going to be asking people for money, and oh, man, it's gonna, all you think about is the building. I knew a guy that, you know, had a nervous breakdown if he built the building. I'm like, well, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. And his wife left him. I'm like, thanks, thanks so much. 
I, I praise the God. I really appreciate you telling me that. Thanks so much. And I meet somebody else. They say something else. And another pastor uh, I met with, I stopped meeting with him for that reason. We used to pray together. He says, oh, I drove by your church the other day, and I see the steel's up, but not much is happening. Are you running out of money? <laughs> Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thanks. No, we're not running out of money. You want to donate? <laughs> a person stopped my wife, another pastor in the grocery store, Tell your husband not to build right now. It's a bad time to build. The economy's bad. He shouldn't be doing it right now. You're going to just pack it away because the end is coming. I'm like, what do I want to? I mean, with people like that, you know what I call them? Faith killers. You said it, not me. She called them joy suckers. They just come in there and they just, they just leech off of you what God has told you to do. I mean, I'm not saying that we don't live in reality, but it comes a point, and I was like, you know what? They're right. I can't do this thing. In fact, I'm, I'm, I think one of my strengths is the fact that I know I'm not perfect. <laughs> I mean, I know I'm not perfect. I know I don't have what it takes, but he has what it takes. And so as we continue to walk and say, okay, God, you said building people to build a building to build more people. And as we continue to walk it out, God met our needs, and here we are today. And so, you know, and now, okay, let's just stop now. Well, thank you. Let's just stop now. Let's just say we've met it. Now we can stop. No, God never calls us to stop. He says go into all the world, right? God has a mission for us. We're never to settle down. We're always to go after him. So let me tell you, keep away from faith killers. If there's people in your life that suck the faith out of you and you can't, thank you, they can't, you can't encourage them, you're better off getting rid of these people. I'm not saying get rid of them in the wrong way, but just severing your relationship. For example, there was 12 spies that went out to look at to the promised land. And when 10 came back, there were giants in the land. We are like grasshoppers compared to them. And the people got discouraged, and fear took over. But there was two guys, Joshua and Caleb, said, no, we surely can do this. It's interesting to me, I've done studies, that about any time you do something, 85 to 90% of the people are going to say you can't do it. It's just, even statistics tell us that. It's amazing how, uh, you know, that's what exactly happened in the Bible. You want to start a company or God calls you to do something, there's going to probably 85 to 90% of the people say, it can't be done. There's no reason for anyone to have a motor car when you have a horse. I mean, things like that, people have said that people have great discoveries. And I, back in 1986, there's no reason for a computer to be more powerful than the Commodore 64. Remember that? <laughs> And now look what we have now. I mean, people say all sorts of things. You see, the difference is this. You gotta hear from God. But God is calling us to do things that by ourselves we cannot do it. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. We must believe he exists and he rewards those who diligently seek him. What are you doing unless God shows up it will not work. What are you doing in your marriage that unless God shows up, it will not work? And I'm not saying being reckless and foolish. What I mean, what I mean is going beyond, I can't take her anymore, I can't take him anymore. Well, you can't take that person anymore. How about you unplug out of yourself and plug into God and say, God, I need your strength through this. God, I can't handle this depression that I'm battling. I need your help, God. I need your help with my finances. And so God will allow these things to happen in your life. I don't, I don't like it very much. I don't want to hear such a thing. But God does allow it. It's easy to forget God when things are going well. When everything is fine and you keep getting pay raises, the kids are in the honor roll, and you know, everything's going awesome, it's very easy to forget about God. Solomon, the greatest king, of that, the wisest king that ever was, it started off his ministry phenomenal. But what happened towards the end of his life? He got comfortable in his own success and began to rely upon himself. He began to plug in to his own battery pack and disconnected from God. And as a result, he charged himself up with strange electricity instead of from God. You see, second point is this. God does not want us to handle it without him. First 2 Corinthians 12 says the following. This is the Apostle Paul talking. One of the greatest people that ever faced the planet. He wrote a third of the New Testament. This is what he says. Even though I've received wonderful revelations from God, so to keep me from being proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from being proud. Now, when I read that, it bothers me. I'm like, God, I don't want any thorns, please. 
I got enough problems. I don't need that. We'll continue to read. He says, three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. And by the way, when you look at the tense and, and the context of how that's written, it doesn't mean he just prayed three times. God, take this away. It means he had three different seasons of prayer where he fasted, perhaps, he prayed, he went after God on different occasions, and finally, after three occasions, God says, my grace is sufficient. Stop asking. We don't know what the thorn in the flesh is. I'm so glad we don't, because we'd make an excuse for that one thing we knew. He said, each time, he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So the power of Christ can work, this is the key, through me. Do you see that? We're not talking about getting it, holding on to it, living off of it. No, we're talking about an active, two-way, ongoing, real-time relationship with God that includes his strength and his ability in your life and in my life to do what he's called us to do. This is what the Apostle Paul is saying. I am weak, but when I'm weak, he has an opportunity to be strong in me. So he says... Each time, verse nine, my grace is all you need. Grace is God's favor and ability. My power works best in my weakness. So now I'm glad to boast about my weakness. So how does it go around? How are you doing? Oh, I'm weak. I'm terrible at self-discipline. I can't control myself. I eat everything in the refrigerator. Praise God. I can't stop smoking. I look, in fact, I'm gonna smoke right now. I can't stop drinking. Oh, I, I praise God. I can't stop complaining. I can't stop spending money. I just get my credit card. To, praise God. I boast in the No, he's not saying that. But he's saying I boast in my weakness because God has an opportunity now to come in because I've come to a place where I'm beyond myself. My friends, the biggest problem you and I often have is we're full of ourselves. People say you're full of it. Usually it's because you're full of yourself. God doesn't want us to be full of it. He wants us to be on a constant stream with him. He wants us to take the plug out of our battery and put it into him and have real time, folks. And the, the thing is this. The more I surrender to God, the more I trust God, I go from 10 amp to 20 amp to 100 amp to 500 amp. You see? It's not that I, I earn God's favor. No, I open myself up to receive more of God. You see, God has, it's like having a Hoover Dam and you have a little pinhole coming out when God says, I can give you a torrent of my presence. It's available to you. So he says, verse nine, he said, my grace is sufficient. Verse nine, so now I'm glad to boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ can work through me. Verse 10, that's why I take pleasure in my weakness in the insults. If you feel insulted, that, I mean, let's face it. Sticks and stones may break your bones, but names, that's, that's baloney. Sticks and stones may bre break your bones, and names will hurt even worse, isn't it? You, some of you are living with things perhaps someone has said to you growing up. Maybe a father, a teacher, and you, when you go, you never amount to anything, you hear something in the back of your, I mean, that's hard, right? But God wants to heal us of these things. He says, that's why I take pleasure, verse 10, in my weaknesses, in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. My friends, when you finally get out of yourself and say, God, I need you to work through me. Notice, it doesn't say, God, you do it for me. It says, God, work through me. There's a partnership about it. I mean, I can, you know, if you have a power tool, you can sit there all you want, but until you plug it in, it's not gonna work, is it? Well, God wants to give you the power to do what you could not do on your own. And he will, and he does. And he's done it through people throughout history, people that were the lowlifes of life, God raised to the very highest. He took these uneducated fishermen, and they were bold. They had no training, and the Pharisees could not compete against them. God takes the foolish he even took the Jewish people. He says, why did I choose the Jewish people? Not because they were the greatest. I chose something small to show that I could work through anybody. And God can work through you and you can do for me. The third point is this. He says this. We can handle it with God working through us. God will give us more than we can handle. God wants us to do things we can't do on our own. And he will work through us. I was reading the Bible 
Uh, I read the Bible every year, and um, you go through the Bible, it's a wonderful experience. I've been doing it for over 10 years now. I encourage you to do the same. It's on our website. Um, you can read through the Bible in a year, and it gives you the Old Testament, New Testament, Psalm, and a Proverb. And I can't tell you how many times I read that during the day. It, it just encourages me. I was just reading, uh, uh, I think it was uh, two days ago, I was reading about Asa. And what happened to Asa? And boy, I could really identify with Asa. You're like, who's Asa? Well, I'll tell you in a second. He was a king of, uh, of, um, of Judea, a king of um, in the northern kingdom, southern kingdom. And it's this would happen, king of Israel. Or Judah, I mean, king of Judah. Let me explain. Israel was the southern kingdom. Okay, there, 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 was, a, there was a break in the kingdoms. The good one was Judah, the bad one was Israel. Okay, that's when it lasted longer. So he was the good king that reigned in Jerusalem. And he came to a point where he came about the end of himself. He had a foe that was bigger and stronger and greater than he was. He came to a point where he was overwhelmed and didn't know what to do. And this is what he says in 2 Chronicles 14, 11. It says the following. Then Asa cried out to his God. Oh, Lord, no one but you can help the powerless against the mighty. He understands that he's powerless. He understands that he was, the odds, it was like David and Goliath. It was, it was the odds were way against him. Oh, Lord, no one but you can help the powerless against the mighty. Help us, O oh Lord, our God, for we trust in you alone. It is in your name that we have come against this vast horde. Oh, Lord, you are our God. Do not let men prevail against you. So the Lord defeated the Ethiopians in the presence of Asa and the army of Judah and the enemy fled. We see that so many times in Scripture where they come, Jehoshaphat or other people or David, they come against something that's so much bigger and so much greater than them. There's no way, humanly speaking, it's possible to do it. But God will meet you. When you say, God, I'm at the end of my marriage. God, I'm at the end of this situation of addiction. God, I'm at the end of this relationship. I don't know what to do. God, what am I supposed to do? And one of the things they teach you in a 12-step program is that you are powerless. That's the place where you begin to find freedom. Now, the 12-step process, by the way, was built on Christian principles. There's some things that are a little wrong with it, but there's some things that are right with it. When you and I realize that we're powerless, that we do not have what it takes, that only through the higher power, well, the higher power is the God Almighty, which is God. We plug into God, saying, God, I need your strength. God, I ask you to flow through me. God, I need you. I need to be plugged into you. I cannot do this on my own. And God goes, finally, you've gotten it. Now there's an opportunity for change. Psalm 61, 2 says this. From the end of the earth, I will cry out to you. When my heart is overwhelmed. Listen, there are going to be times you're going to be overwhelmed. You're like, no kidding, <laughs> okay. There are times you're going to be overwhelmed. The Bible says, I will cry out to you when my heart is overwhelmed. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me what I need. No, he doesn't say that, does he? He goes, I can do all things through Christ. That, that through it indicates an ongoing, real-time relationship. We're not talking about picking up what you need and going forward. No, it's an ongoing walkie-talkie, if you will, communication with God, praying without ceasing, relying on God. God, I don't know how I'm going to handle this boss today. I want to quit, but Father, I'm going to plug into you. Give me the strength I need to do this, God. God, I don't know what to do with this situation, this emotions I'm facing, this depression, this anxiety, God, this fear. God, I don't know what going to happen with my job or my finances or my children to drive me nuts. I don't know if they're going to make it or not, God. What's going to happen? I don't have the strength. Plug into God. And this is what's really, really important about plugging into God. He's not asking us just to plug into him alone. He's asking us to plug into his entire body. The Bible says in the book of James, chapter 5, it says, confess your sins to one another that you would be healed. 
My friends, you and I are created to be in community. We're created to work together. No one has everything that they need. God has purposely left deficits in myself and yourself. But when we all come together, connected to the head, we become complete. And our deficits begin to be paid by the grace and the presence of a real-time relationship with God. You see, it's not just you and God in his head. It's not just, imagine, how good is a hand connected to the brain without the arm, without the muscle, without the sinews? You need the body. And part of the body is, is the body of Christ, the church. That's why we want to encourage you. A lot of you are doing this all by yourself and you can't make it through. Listen, there's been people, I had a friend of mine call me about six months ago and says, please pray for me. I said, what's going on? This person took a bunch of people and they're spreading lies about me and he was beyond himself. Please pray for me. And so I prayed for him. He called his other pastor friends. I said, I'll lift you up. And he said, thank you so much. I felt better. I, I felt, thank you for the advice. And there's times I go through stuff. God, what am I supposed to do? I'll, pick, I'll pray to God, but I'll pick up the phone to a godly man and say, I don't know what to do. Help me. I need help here. And a godly man's, godly men, my friends will speak into my life and I'll join hands. Listen, so many of you are by yourself. God has called us to be an army. Our army doesn't do much if they're all separated. Can you imagine trying to fight the enemy? This one goes this way, this one goes this way. It's like herding cats. You never see attack cats, do you? Dogs working. God wants us to be an army that works together. What would happen if we connected to God and each other? I think a lot of us would overcome a lot of stuff we have a hard time overcoming right now. So we want to encourage you to get involved with small groups. That's part of the vision of this church is to get us connected to God and each other, that we can help each other. As much as I love Sunday morning, and I do love it, you, you know, just being around someone's table or sitting on the couch with somebody and saying, crying out and saying, Will you pray for me, and you have people that care about you and they're connected to each other. God wants us to be that kind of church. Why? Because he wants to utilize us. God has much greater stuff for us today. If we can do church without God, then we don't have God. God is calling us beyond where we are. It says in the scriptures in Romans 8, 37. Yet in all these things, we're more than conquerors. Listen, hear that wonderful word again. Through him. Do you see that, folks? Every time it's about God overcoming in our life, it's never about God, I'm gonna install something in you and leave you alone. Many people just think, well, God will give me this thing and he'll leave me alone. No, God never wants you to be left alone. He wants to work with you constantly. Jesus said, I do nothing unless the Father shows me. He didn't say unless the Father showed me. He says, shows me. It's very, very important you understand that. If he showed him, it's a predetermined plan that he's paying attention to. If it shows him, it's a constant communication that is happening. And everything Jesus did, he did with a constant communication with God. It's an opportunity you and I have to go higher and greater than we ever thought possible. I know you look at our society today, you look at our country, you look at our world, it can be really discouraging. But what would happen if God's church, what would happen, forget about this, the whole church. I mean, I, I don't want to forget about them, but I'm saying, what would happen just here at Cornerstone alone if we would go after God and refuse to live by yesterday's experiences and plug into him, get out of our battery packs, get into the source, what would happen if we worked together and covered each other's weaknesses and we encouraged each other? Imagine what could happen to our marriages. Imagine what would happen to our school systems. Imagine what would happen to our towns. My friends, I believe if God can take 120 people and turn the world upside down as he did in the day of Pentecost, he, we have more than that here. God could do great stuff just through us. But I'm not living in a delusion either where it's just going to be, oh, it's just cornerstone. No, I want to connect to other churches, and we are. Because we believe God has great plans for us. 1 Peter 4, 12 says this, Dear friends, don't be surprised by the fiery trials you're going through as if something strange were happening to you. Sometimes stuff happens, folks. Instead, be very glad, for these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering so that you'll have wonderful joy in seeking glory when it's revealed to the world. The Apostle Paul says in Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things by what God has given me. No, it doesn't say that. I can do all things through real-time 
relationship plugged in to God. Now, let me explain to you, why do we read the Bible? Why do we come to church? Why do we get in fellowship with other believers? You know what happens? What we do is we get our ampage from 10 amps to 100 amps. It's like, a, imagine this, imagine you get the Hoover Dam, you get a little pin, as I mentioned earlier. What we're doing, we're taking brick by brick out. We're getting more of a flow in each other. And the more you spend time with God, the more rubbish we get out of the way, the more his love can flood us. It isn't God doesn't want to bless us, he does but we can participate in letting him come into our lives. But if we refuse, no, I got all I need. I have everything I need. I heard people say that. There's so much more of God available to us today. We've only scratched the surface, my friends, of what we've had. Jesus says in John 15, four, to his disciples and to us today, remain in me and I am. You're gonna ask the worship team to make their way up. Remain in me and I will remain in in you for a branch cannot produce fruit if it's severed from the vine and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain you see that remaining in me staying in me i love this particular verse coming on and conclude with this who shall separate us from the love of christ it's our tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness, or peril, or sword. That's a pretty big list. It covers just about everything. As it is written, for your sake, we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Verse 37, yet in all of these things, we're more than conquerors by what he's given us? No. Through him. I hope we see the difference today. Listen, I don't know about you, but I want to be through him. I, I, I'm not interested in relying on my seminary degree, my master's divinity degree, and I'm not interested in, 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 in all the sermons of the past and finding something I did in the past, and, and let's just get the canned soup out. Let's just, no, God wants to do so much more, but we need to have an ongoing through him. Are you willing to take the battery out and say, I'm not going to rely on my own battery anymore. I'm going direct to God. No more of this. I'm going to be plugged into him. And when I'm not plugged in, I'm a failure. And when I'm plugged into him, I win. That's what I want to do as a, as a pastor of this church. And I want to see you do the same, guys. We have an opportunity to do more than we could ever ask or imagine if we would believe God. There's no telling what we can do together. And so I want to encourage you today that God, maybe some of you are overwhelmed. I can't take it anymore. Well, you're in a good place because God has an opportunity to touch you. First thing I want to say to you today, if if you've never given your life to Jesus Christ and you've never done it on your own, you're not connected to God, you're broken, something in you is not right, you've tried everything else, doesn't work. Listen, the only thing that works is God because you're made by God for God. It only works that way. That's your design. Are you willing to say, okay, I, I'm, I'm going to unplug from myself. I'm going to plug into God. I'm going to trust God for my healing. I'm going to trust God. I'm not going to be by myself anymore. God, I give my life to you. I surrender the power cord, and I plug into God. How does that happen? It happens by giving your life to Christ. And some of you here today, you're giving your life to Christ. But what we've had, I've done it too. I constantly rely on myself. God, I can't do this can't. I don't have the emotional fortitude. I don't have the intelligence. I don't have the power. I don't have the strength to deal with this sickness. I don't have the strength to deal with this relationship. I don't have the strength to deal with this church. I don't have the strength to deal with this country. God, I don't know what I can do, but Lord, I don't know, but you're strong. And so Father, I'm going to rely upon you. I'm going to plug into you. And part of plugging into Jesus is plugging into his body. Today at 101, we have an opportunity for you to find out what Cornerstone's about. It could be a start for you guys. I'm not saying it's the answer, but get connected. Don't be by yourself anymore. The body of Christ is God on earth, connected to his head. Let's get together. Let's join hands. Let's make it happen by believing and walking through the power of Christ that he has for us. Let's pray right now. Maybe some of you are saying, Pastor, I've never given my life to Christ. I know about Christ. I heard about him. But frankly, I never have done it. 
The only way you can truly be plugged into God is you have to get to the place where you're, you're beyond yourself and say, God, I cannot do it on my own anymore. I give up control. I lay my life down before you. That's the first thing you need to pray. Second thing is, God, forgive me of all of my sins. And the beautiful thing is, you can never be good enough, but if you confess your sins, the Bible says he's faithful to take all your sins away. And everything you've ever done is put on the cross of Christ, paid in full, that you have access to God. So I'm going to pray a prayer right now. If you pray this with your heart, it's a new beginning. I'm going to pray right now. Lord Jesus, I thank you for dying on the cross for me. I believe you are the Son of God. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins, all the things I've done wrong, even the things I did wrong on the way to church today. Lord, I ask you to forgive me of my past and my present. I confess the things I've done wrong and the things I don't know. I ask you to cleanse me, make me pure, wash me clean, and I hand over my life to you. I command, I say today, you are my God. You are the boss of my life. I give my life to you today afresh. Give me the power, now, Lord, to walk the path I have for me, you have for me in Jesus' name. With every head bowed, real quickly, can I say anyone today, the pastor, that was me, I just prayed that prayer just so I can know how to pray for you better. Anyone here today say, Pastor, that was me. Thank you for being honest. Appreciate that. Anyone else here this morning? Come on, let's be honest. Let's, let, why, okay, appreciate that. Let's, let's work together. Now let's give an opportunity to the rest of us here today. How many of you would say, I'm ready to unplug for myself? I want to plug into God. I want to believe God. And as a church, I think God is calling us to reach out like we've never have before. We have an opportunity to do that together. Let's all stand if we could. I'm going to pray a prayer right now. It's going to be a prayer of repentance. We're asking God to forgive us and ask God to fill us. We want to pray. We want to get, get, stop being full of it and be full of Him. So Lord Jesus, I recognize today that I have relied upon myself. Too often, I have lived in the past. I've lived on past relationships I've had with you. I've lived in my own strength and my own power. I realize today, Jesus, I'm reminded today that I must be plugged into you and not myself, and that through you, I can do all things. And so, Father, today, I throw the battery out, and I take the plug, and I plug into you, God, asking you to fill me with your power and your grace. And, Father, I also understand the need for me to be around other, other Christians, other believers, we can encourage each other. And Father, I just pray for your healing upon us today, God, that we could do more than we ever thought possible because we're connected to you and each other in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask the prayer team to make their way up. If you need prayer for anything at all, we want to pray for you. If you prayed that prayer today, we want to come up and, and tell somebody we have something for you to help you along on your way. But let's sing this one last song as we do that. Prayer team, please make your way up. play quietly. We're going to dismiss you at this point. Go in the power of his strength and his grace. Let his power flow through you that you could be and understand the love of God in Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you guys.